Amen. 30th. And the subject is image makeover. My name is Betsy Gata, and I'm the moderator for this session. And the panelists are Jean and Connie Triplett. Now, Jean was the first person to attend Caller Lab when he was the uh, chairman of the National Convention, which took place in Charlotte, North Carolina, in 1998. He was the first of the people who attended the convention as the convention general chairman, who attended the Caller Lab convention. And so he has now, this is his 13th Caller Lab, and Connie has attended 12. They're from North Carolina, and they will be our our panelists today. And I was telling someone in the hall, just because Jean and Connie are listed as a panelist does not mean that I do not have stuff to say. So <laughs> I, will be, I will be going along and, and giving some ideas of mine. But I want to welcome Jean and Connie and give them a nice round of applause. And then I'm going to turn the mic over to them. Thank you, Betsy. Um, when we attended the first Caller Lab convention in 96, uh, the first one we attended, not the first Caller Lab convention, but it was at the uh, request of our program chairman for our 98 uh, convention, Ron Jacobs, and he felt that the best way to get the callers to come to Charlotte was to go to your all's convention. And so since then, a lot of the other general chairmen have come along and attended uh, a lot of the conventions and we have two with us today, um, so it's a, it's a way that we connect with the callers who are a, a very important part of our national convention. But when Gail sent us an email and asked us to be on the panel with Betsy, um, I thought long and hard about it. It's an argument that you cannot win or a discussion that you can't. You're going to have disagreements all over the board. Um, as I told Betsy uh, Sunday, I still kind of believe in the crinolines of short skirts. Uh, if you've ever been up on top of a balcony and watched the dancing, uh, it is really, really nice to see. But I also know that we kind of sometimes have to make changes. And uh, just because it's the way we've always done it doesn't mean that we can't change it. I'm, I'm going to sneak right in here and say, Gene and I have, have kind of agreed to disagree <laughs> because I started dancing in 1952. No woman in 1952 would ever have worn a skirt that short. Yes, they wore crinolines because crinolines were in vogue. So to me, the longer skirts are really graceful. Yep. When we started in 82, Connie and I took classes in 82, and you didn't go to a dance the ladies didn't go if they didn't wear the crinolines and the, and the skirts, short skirts. Um, when I say short skirts, I'm referring to the knee length, not like some you see today. Um, but uh, it's um, we have clubs now in our area that that go casual all year round, and they have they dance six, seven, eight squares a night. Um, and you see them in all different types of outfit outfits. Um, our club at home, we go casual during the um, summer months, June, July, and August, because of the weather. When you're from the south, it does get warm a lot. And uh, even though our church that we dance in is air conditioned, it's still after you, if you put six, eight, ten squares in there dancing, you cannot keep it cool enough for everybody. So we understand that. Um, even when when we dance casual, I do not wear shorts. I always wear long trousers, long pants, and probably seven out of ten times I'll have a long sleeve shirt on. Because I just feel like that's – I don't have – my arms are not real hairy, but I do perspire a lot, and I know the ladies don't like to grab those sweaty, hairy arms. So I will wear a long sleeve shirt most of the time. We go to class. If I, we, we work with the classes a lot. I always wear my long sleeve shirts, even if we're doing a class in the summertime. And um, so um, we, in our club, when we dance during the months, the regular uh, 
winter months where we request proper square dance attire. Now, that's the question that you can get a lot of meanings with that. But if you come in, if you come to our dance and you have on a pair of shorts and a T-shirt, you're welcome to dance at our club, and we don't say anything to you. We don't we don't disrespect you for coming that way. Um, but if your club is a dress club, I am not coming to your club dressed in shorts. That's just my personal feelings. Um, so it doesn't matter. Um, I guess um, I think we kind of lessen the um, respect for our activity by allowing people to come and dance in shorts and flip-flops. And you, we do get We've had some men and ladies that come to our club in flip-flops. I don't think that's the way to do it. But, um, again, you know, we. I think when you start changing your, your dress, you know, we had the crinolines and the skirts and the western pants. Then we said, okay, it would be all right to wear prairie skirts. The ladies could wear prairie skirts. Men could wear dress jeans. Now we have men and ladies as well coming to clubs with a dress, with the jeans, with the knees cut out, raggedy bottoms, and this type of thing. As Betsy told me, she said, "Well, they probably paid more for those jeans than you did the pair you're wearing." I said, "Well, that's probably true, but they're not, they're not air conditioned, you know." Um, I don't think. Uh, I don't think western pants and a long sleeve shirt is any hotter to wear than what I have on today, which is a pair of jeans, which is heavy material, and a short sleeve polo. I don't see any difference in it. Um, but again, it's a personal preference. If your club wants to go casual and you attract dancers and you get new people in their activities, then I think that's the way we, that's where your club needs to go. But if you're going visiting a club, you should check and see what their dress code is and show them the respect of going and dressed as they as they dress. Same thing if you go to a festival, same thing and everything. So um, I have some comments I want to read later. Um, we have a website. NEC has a website, and these were on our website uh and I want to get to some of those later and let you know how some people think about comments that were made to them. And I'll shut up for a little while and let Connie say something. He doesn't shut up much. He does most of the talking in our house or wherever we are. But over the years, the dress code has relaxed, as you all know, uh, the last 10 or 15 years. It has gotten more casual in whatever type of activity of square dance, whether it be a state festival, your local clubs, or a national convention. Uh, most of your state festivals do set their own dress code that they like for people to wear. In the afternoon, a lot of the festivals don't mind if you come casual, but again, at night, they do prefer you to dress in either prairie skirts or your traditional attire, which we refer to as the crinolines and petticoats. Like Betsy was referring to a while ago in the 50s, and, and I, I was quite young in the 50s, but um, we did wear what we call ballerina length, and we did wear crinolines. Um, my mom used to uh, use sugar starch to starch those crinolines to make them stiff and make our petticoats, uh, make our skirt stand out. But... Um, I know most of the different parts of the country, you do have different dress codes, and we would like to hear some of your suggestions or comments pertaining to what type of dress in your area. Uh, as Jean said, in the south, we do get hot. I guess it gets hot in the north, too, probably, <laughs> in the August, September, a couple of days. But we would like to hear some comments of, of what you think. We have traditional square dance at the National exec, um, National Square Dance Convention every year, and I know we do get a lot of comments 
of why can't we go casual in the afternoon. A lot of people don't think that should be, and we have a lot that would prefer that it be casual because it is in the summertime in, in June, and it does go around the country in the different parts, and sometime it is very, very hot. Uh, we got up to 105 degrees in Charlotte when we had it in 98. Canceled our parade. Um, Betsy, do you have any other comments that you'd like to make? Yeah. <laughs> Betsy is never without comment. Oh, basically, I'm going to say to me, it's not it's not the dress code per se or the traditional and I keep putting that in quotes because traditional only goes back to like 1969 or 70 before that hemlines were longer and I, my skirts in the in the 60s came below my knee um, and they didn't go up until the late 60s when hemlines rose in the normal fashion world but my problem is the rigidity of the people and the lack of tolerance on both sides. One of the things that is, you know, you, you put throw out the dress code to anybody, and you'll have somebody passionately for abolishing, someone passionately for wearing the traditional attire, and those two people will, will not agree, and what happens is, the the folks who are passionate for the casual, if I want to come in a short skirt with a crinoline, they look at me and go, well, you know, why are you just so behind the times? With a sneer. Because they are passionate, it has to be abolished. And in the same time, the people who are passionate, and, and, and Gene and Connie are obviously much more relaxed than that, but the people that are passionate, it has to be the traditional attire, would look at me if I came in in the outfit that I'm wearing now and go, why don't you meet our dress code standards? And I consider that I'm dressed pretty nicely, but I'm not wearing traditional attire. And the problem is that we are so busy in the square dance world focused on what in the heck people are wearing that we don't bother to focus on bringing people into the activity. And we talk about to the outside where they, we should they, we should never air our laundry out there, we end up talking about the dress code instead of talking about the fun and fellowship and the physical exercise of square dancing, which is what we should be promoting. So the dress code is like this big, giant rock hovering on a point over us that is kind of shadowing the activity because... We're so focused on whether we should or shouldn't. And what we should be doing is uh, understanding that there should be tolerance. We should be able to accept the people. If somebody comes to your dance and wants to dance and does not have on, quote, proper attire, I'd rather see them on the floor. And Gene and Connie have said in their club they'd rather let them dance. But there are clubs that would turn them away. How, How? What kind of impression are they going to have? Now, I'm reasonably old, and when I, well, I'm not in the, I'm not in the, the total aged category, but I unfortunately can no longer really count myself as middle aged, although I'd like to. But when I went to school, I had a dress code. The people who followed me later do not. Roy taught school up until about three years ago, and there was no dress code. And they tried, in his high school, they started to try and promote or, or encourage or work around the girls who were wearing things that showed way too much midriff, you know, like from the, the bottom of the bra to below the belly button because it was distracting probably to the boys and, that'll, and to say nothing of the gentlemen, the male teachers. But it was so careful that... Roy, as a, a male teacher, really couldn't address the situation. He had to go to some a female because otherwise he would be charged with sexual harassment for noticing that she was a bear from here to there. Now, can you explain to me how he couldn't notice? I would notice. But the point, the point being that these kids have, you know, the folks in their 40s, 30s, 20s, Teens have grown up without 
dress code restrictions. If we are too rigid, we are not going to let them into our activity. Notice I didn't say we're not going to welcome them. We're not even going to let them in because they're not used to someone saying, you have to wear this. Nobody has done that for them. When I was, I just found, um, I just found old, and this will tell you how old I am. I just found old negatives, black and white, that I had prints made from. And one of them turned out to be me and my mom in our Girl Scout uniforms. Well, you watch a parade with the Girl Scouts now. You know, they, they, they have a sash with their badges and the rest of it is just whatever they happen to be wearing. You, you don't, you don't even, or a vest, thank you. And you don't even see them in like all black skirts and white shirts or black pants and white shirts. They wear, there's no uniform. Not even for something like the Girl Scouts. So those kids are not going to be really uh, comfortable with anyone saying, you must wear this to participate. And that's part. Of, but part of our problem is we're so busy talking about that that we don't talk about the benefits of the activity. Back to you guys. I think the um, – I think our callers – and our cures um, and our leaders of the activity have a lot to do with the the dress. It's how you, as a caller or cure, project your own image. If you have a caller that comes in jeans and a t-shirt, then that's what the dancers are, they that's what they think they can wear and would would wear. But if you have a caller that comes and teaches a class or calls your your club dance. And we have some in Charlotte that don't, they don't dress appropriately, but we still go to their dances. But I think that it all starts at the top as far as the dress codes are concerned. And it's what those callers, cures teach as they go through. I was just looking here, um, I was talking about uh, the ladies and said, if you want to get a, a lot of women back into skirts, just take a picture of them from the back after they have danced a tip. Those knit, knit t-shirts right up over the hips and backs, backsides and accentuate the positives. They cling to and outline the love handles. And then it said, don't leave out the guys. It said, tummies are not shown to their advantage when actively dancing, causing the t-shirts to pull out in the front. As the belt buckle goes down and the arms go up, there is a gap that should not be seen. This gap can occur in back, resulting in crack exposures. If the men bend forward, T-shirts all show hairy, sweaty armpits. Do you really want to swing with a damp gorilla? So that's the way some of the ladies look at it. And uh, I'll brag about myself a little bit. I just recently, over the past year, have lost about 30 pounds. Prior to that, if I put on a T-shirt a little bit snug, you know how it looked on me. So I didn't wear them. I bought extra large. Sometimes I bought the double X. Just show, just so I had the room to expand out to it. So we, we need to think about our appearances as much as what someone's dress codes are. We have a gentleman that comes to our club. Even in the wintertime, he comes in a pair of shorts. And most of the time in a golf t-shirt or a golf polo shirt. The polo shirt is a little bit tight. And he's a little bit heavy. So you can imagine the sight when you see it. So I think we really need to show our personal, make sure our personal appearances are good. And I think that's that's what I think most of us would really like to see. It's not whether you have on a crinoline or a prairie skirt or for the ladies if you're in shorts. As long as they fit neat, appropriately, and look good on you. I think that is the, that's what we need. And I think the music has a lot to do with our activity also. Me again. New class members. Are we on? Okay. <laughs> I guess I just talk low. But when we have classes, the couples that come in now, and they are the probably uh, 40 50 range mostly, some of them are younger, they have a problem with wearing crinolines. 
most of the new dancers do not like it. There's there's a few that have seen it and say, oh, that's so pretty. You know, we want some of those. So we our teacher keeps a stock of um, leftover experienced dancewear. And they can go in and, and pick out, and they do. And they are, uh, we've had some young people that have come in, and they were like uh, maybe in the teens, and they have enjoyed wearing those crinolines, which really surprised us because teens now like the tank tops and the and the shorts and the, as Jean says, the flip flops. But um, we do get a group that does come in and and right away they start wearing the crinolines and um, prayer skirts or whatever the tradition is in that particular area. But um, it is, as we grow older, I guess the the ones that are coming along do not want to wear those uh, fancy clothes. When we go out and do exhibitions, everybody looks and says, oh, how pretty. If we go into a restaurant with our Quinlan's on, they, they uh, come over and, and talk to us about our costumes. They call them costumes. If you're not a dancer, it's a costume. Well, to us it's clothes, but I guess it is a costume, right? But um, I guess as, as we go into the future, we're going to have to look very close at what we do wear. And as Jean says, we, we welcome anybody into our dance club. It doesn't matter what they have on. And years ago when we first started, you didn't dare go to a dance unless you were dressed properly. When we were taking our classes, uh, our class was on a Tuesday night, and I traveled in my job. And a lot of times I'd be gone on Tuesday night. So <clears throat> we hooked up with another club that had classes on Monday night. And during the summertime, I would wear short sleeve shirts with my suits as opposed to a long sleeve. And so I was running late on Monday night, and so I just went straight from work. Met Connie at work, met Connie there, and I had on my short sleeve. And the caller didn't say anything to me. But when we left, he walked over and he says, don't forget next time, long sleeve. And that's all he said. And I think we just need a subtle reminder sometimes. And I never went back again without a, a long sleeve shirt on if I felt like I might be a little bit late, I'd wear a long sleeve shirt to work. So uh, I think it's just a way of, I think you honor the people and you respect them if you go with them, if you go to their dance and uh, wear similar clothes to what they're wearing. So, Betsy? Okay, did I turn this on? Yes. Um, I want to... I want to move on. We have covered dress code more than enough. I want to move on. Connie mentioned music. And if we have time, I will play, you know, some, I have set up the mini disc and I have some stuff that I would use. But what I want to say is as a caller and queuer, I got to stand up to talk. I can't do this sitting down. I move around. I have to talk. Okay. As a caller or, and or a queuer, but as a caller, um, are you aware of what what people might be peering in, peeking in, or walking by your dance venue. Obviously, if you're going to go out and do a demonstration or, you, or, or an exhibition, you're aware that there are going to be people watching. But what about if you dance in a hall where there's other things, maybe in a school where there's other things going on that night? Are you aware that the whatever music you're playing is going to be heard by the people passing by? Are you, do you pick what you select to show a variety of music? Now, I have, to, I have to preface this. I'm from the northern New Jersey area. I'm 45 minutes from New York City and about an hour and a quarter from Philadelphia. And that's kind of a suburban area. And in the New York area, there is not a country western station on the radio. You cannot find it. Period. End of sentence. They revived an oldie station a, a few years ago, so you can kind of get that. Other than that, there's the music that they play for the predominant 
audience of 20 to 30 year or, or 15, 20 year olds and the, and the kids and whatever. So the point being that there is a stereotype that I know in our area that, you know, square dancing is always country. It's done to country music and, and, and associated with that are, and I apologize to anyone who makes their living growing our food. But as associated with that is the idea of country music, farmers, hicks, possibly not too educated. No offense to anybody. I'm talking about what I hear people think, not what I actually think. But that, so in our area, it's like, oh no, that's, that's very nice. Not for me. I'm too sophisticated. So whenever I'm a, around and you know out in a, a dance i am aware of how many people are coming in and i am programming my music to show a variety not to show no country but to show a variety a year or two ago we had an opportunity to be a part of a multicultural festival in trenton new jersey trenton's the capital of new jersey it's urban uh But there was all these different people showing their different dance styles from their heritage. And we had like up to 15 minutes to show square dancing. So what now what did I pick for music? I started off and I announced things and I started off and said, now we're going to do something called a singing call. And I used Walking After Midnight by, you know, the Patsy Cline recorded. And I said, I'm using this tune because I know you all expect country music, so here's one for you. Then I did a patter and I put on Funky Town and I said, but we do dance to other things and cool rhythms. And the last thing I used was another singing call that was Hakuna Matata because it was a Broadway show when the kids knew it, and I figured that covered all bases. And I announced that. I said, and we like to dance to the Broadway tunes. Here's something from The Lion King. So that I made a point of not just using different music but talking about it and pointing out, listen to this. This is not what you expect. Listen to this. This is what you expect. And... There was another time when I was up in Connecticut and there was a, 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 we're in a town, the basement of a town hall. The club dances in the basement of a town hall. Upstairs they were doing a theatrical production of Grease. Okay. People came down to use the restroom downstairs as well as upstairs when the, whether there was an intermission or whatever. When don't you know that I had on the table like you're the one that I want and I made sure that singing call started playing as soon as people started coming down to use the bathroom because it's from Greece. And I figure, I'm not gonna convert, I'm not gonna convert people by one singing call. I'm just gonna possibly change the impression that we're making. And if I can change the impression we're making a little bit each time, then people will relate. One of the best things in, in northern New Jersey that happened, and we've had some good things happening in northern New Jersey, let's cross our fingers it keeps up. Several years ago now, a man who was in a square dance club also worked for one of the major newspapers. And he wrote an article, you know, a, a Sunday, Sunday supplement piece, you know, uh, but, uh, but a people article. I, I can't think of what I actually want to call it in journalism terms. But, you know, an article that was a, uh, interesting to people and, you know, that sort of human interest. Thank you. Human interest piece. And... He interviewed, you know, he talked about square dancing. He interviewed people. Every person that he interviewed, that he gave a name and an occupation. So it might be, um, you know, Dr. Bell, retired school administrator, age 72. And then it was Dan Koft, age 48, works in the computer uh, help department at Rutgers University. Then it would be uh, Mickey Biggs, age age 55, truck driver. And he every person, and he had a variety of people, but every one of them had the occupation. And there were people who came out to lessons after that particular art particular article who were not dragged in by their friends and i believe it's because instead of being those nice people in the pretty costumes we became human 
We became people that somebody else in the outside dance world, the, da- the world outside our square dance world, could relate to. We became somebody who, you know, it's like, oh, they are like me. So that, to me, is very important. One thing about the music that uh, Betsy was talking about, we have a caller, and a lot of y'all may know him, Paul Walker. And at their club, they do a lot of gospel. And they have, there was a caller with him, uh, close to where he lives and a lady, and they do a lot of trio. And so they do a lot of gospel songs when they're doing their uh, square dance. Several years ago, there, um, and I can't remember if it was the foundation, Betsy might remember, there was an organization that um, had a survey across the country. Different cities were picked out. Uh, There was one in Charlotte, and we were a part of that survey to find out how people um, perceive square dance. It, it, it was through Caller Lab, yes. I was thinking it was through the foundation. But there were statistics um, compiled, and it was amazing how many people, as Betsy said, thought square dancing was something for uh, country, not for uh, anybody in the modern world. Uh, any, I mean, we've got doctors, dentists, Mike, Um, other types of professional people that are square dancers. Um, We've had a lot of ministers in our area that were square dancers, them and their wives. Um, So, and I I can't remember, it was was probably 10 years ago, Betsy, that that was done, maybe 8 to 10 years ago. But um, I think at that time we just wanted to see how many, people in the United States that we could come up with that uh, thought square dancing was square and not as we all enjoy it. Um, We've sat up here and talked for 30 minutes, and I think if Betsy agrees, we'd like to hear from some of you all and see what your comments are and uh, uh, see what you think we need to do to remake our image. Uh, uh, Connie volunteered. Thank you. Please state your name when you... Hi, I'm John Herr from Denver. And uh, another aspect, just take another uh, angle from what Betsy was talking about, and that is as callers and for us cures... Uh, we have to create the showmanship, which we're going to talk about next session, okay? Showmanship, when people watch what's going on, if, if the leader, we leaders are causing the people to yell and shout and show that they're really having fun, we have to create that enthusiasm and then people say, man, they're having fun. I want to do that. Um, Ruth Fullaway from Maui. Well, we encourage visitors to come. And I just can't ask people to travel that far and have uh, (laughs) square dance clothes with them. So uh, I remember not too long ago one night the caller had on long pants. All the rest of the men had on shorts. (laughs) Yeah, Dan Prosser, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the problems, or the, one of the big problems, it dresses one of the music is an issue. But per, if you're into sales and you understand sales, it's a per, it's perception, and you were just related, or you had mentioned about perceived that it's a country activity. One of the big drawbacks is we walk in with 45 records, which are 1950. Okay, we walk in with a turntable. All right, nothing matter with Hilton turntables, excellent product, 1960. All right. Most of the people that we're trying to attract may not have seen a record player in their home, okay, in their life. Right, right. In the last eight years, I have moved to a to a small mixer box power amp, 
and uh, I use, now use a computer. I do school programs, everything from kindergarten through 12th grade. I do home school programs, and I do adult programs. Our square dance club has over 100 members. Uh, we teach new dancers every year, but it is a perception issue. Uh, we went through a, a, a an airport, and a lady looked at my record player, and she says, "Wow." She says, that really must be old, you know, and I, and she says, and I said, yeah, and they're $1,500. You know? <laughs> so the, what we need to do is, is, Betsy is saying, we need to change our perception. But one of the things, and I know it's hard for people that have used records for years, but it is very difficult to convince people if you're using records, okay, that you are a modern activity. My friend, my friend Dan was out doing a program, and Dan is, Dan, was very busy up until recently. Dan has uh, a wife and a daughter. He works for Rutgers University. He was getting a master's degree, and he was calling square dances. So the time that it took to convert from records to other medium just simply was not in his life at that point in time. He had to finish the master's before he could look around and breathe. But So he was working off a combination of CDs and records mostly. And so he was at a, at a dance for kids, and the little kid asked him, what's the big black CD? <laughs> Coming over there and then here. I'm Michael Krupa. I'm from the, the District of Columbia. Um, as a matter of fact, I belong to the only club that dances in the District of Columbia. But... Uh, there are, I'm in an area that's very blessed with square dancing because all around us in Virginia and Maryland, you could dance every night of the week. As a matter of fact, it's not uncommon to dance every night of the week at various clubs, whether they be straight or gay. My point being is, is that in all that time, none of those clubs in any way, shape, or form ever require any kind of a dress code. So, you know, like you were saying, in the summertime, you know, you walk into the club and the guys are wearing shorts and, you know, short sleeve shirts um, or, you know, long pants and short sleeve shirts. The callers are always wearing long pants and long sleeve shirts, no matter what the club is, no matter what time of year it is. Um, but as was just pointed out by the gentleman in the back, it's the perception You know, the people have a perception of the country, and I hate to use the word hick, but that's what happens. And and this was brought home. Um, Both of my partners were called to be interviewed. They're both callers, and they were called to be interviewed by a local local newspaper, Human Interest Story. And the guy was talking to him for a while, and um, he asked where they could meet to – to have the interview, and my one partner said, he said, well, you know, you can come over to our place and we'll do the interview right here. And, and the, the reporter responds, he says, oh, you have, you have bales of hay in your basement? <laughs> and, 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 and Betsy knows the one partner just, you know, was, was just ready to, to, to bloom. Yes, exactly. And his response is that we are a, we are a no banjo, no fiddle zone. And, you know, and that was, that was a real eye-opening experience. And he, he even included that in the, in the article about, you know, the image of what square dancing is about. I'm Susan White from Hot Springs Village, Arkansas, and my husband is a caller. We started a caller run club when we moved to Hot Springs Village uh, so that Gordon could have some place to call. And there's not a lot of square dance activity there. And so we feel that when we present the image of square dancing, uh, we have to present it uh, so that we would never discourage anyone for any reason. Um, We have two types of demonstration that we think about when we're talking about dressing, and one of them is a recruiting demonstration, such as you would do for the public at a farmer's market or some other public venue. And for that, we use a costume uh, that's neat, uh, but it is a costume. We have... uh, um, polo shirts with uh, dancers on them. We don't have a club on it. Oh, hey, there you go. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, have shirt will travel. Uh, this this is actually from the Rochester Area Federation, uh, and they have a uh, trademark for the back of it. And you'll find these at the at national convention, I'm sure. But... Uh, we don't have a collar th- a club thing on it. We weren't really sure how long our club was going to last. And these, this also happens to be the same color as the other club that we dance with. And we, of course, recruit dancers from there to help us. Um, our demonstration team wears the same shirt and uh, the same color pants or skirt. We say uh, khaki pants or skirt. Uh, we do not use shorts, even though it is warm weather. Uh, our demonstration team... Uh, 
for um, entertainment purposes, for um, going to the nursing homes or some other kind of an entertainment venue where we are really not recruiting, uh, that's more apt to be uh, what we call frou-frou. Uh, uh, and our, our advertising or our, our notice notifications for our dances uh, say something like uh, modern Western square dancing, all Western dancers welcome, uh, uh, singles friendly, dresses casual, square dance attire optional. So as far as that kind of image, uh, and for for our friends, uh, we always, when we, we want to demonstrate square dance music, we put on Mike Seastrom, uh, and uh, his, is it the second one on his record, is reg- Reggae, One World Reggae. And that's square dance music? <laughs> so we try to keep it so that uh, we wouldn't discourage anyone that wanted to walk through our door. And we do not have lessons. We have new dancer programs. Ron Shane from 59th National in Louisville um, in this coming June. Um, talking about perception, a few years back we had the National Singles Convention in in Nashville, Ron Holland's convention, and the um, candy camera came, and um, unbeknownst to the dancers, and they were in a, a skybox up over the auditorium. They opened the curtains, and they were video. Uh, they were filming us dancing below. And you talk about perception. We thought, oh, this is great. What a wonderful way to promote square dancing to the to the country. I don't know if anyone's seen this episode. It does play occasionally on cable anymore on the uh, cable satellite. Um, stations, but back then it was played quite often, I'd say four or five times a year for a few years, but they put the old cartoon to it where you poke mine and I'll swing yours and all this kind of thing, the hillbilly cartoon that was around for many, many years, <clears throat> they made fun of it, but it, it, it still got us out and, you know, where we were seen across the country, but that's the perception that everybody got, you know, it was the square dance and the hick thing. Virgil Forbes from Baltimore. Um, every time I start a new class, the first night, there's always the question of dress. I say, I have a very strict dress code. You must be dressed. Good shoes essential. Other than that, as long as it's reasonably clean and reasonably modest, I don't care. I just want people on the floor. Um, I've never had anybody show up in the uh, tip, uh, the itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. But if somebody wanted to show up and dance that way, I wouldn't turn them away. I'd have to think about it, but I wouldn't. <laughs> I'll be right there. Bro. <laughs> uh, the other thing, music. Um, and I have a hard time differentiating between recruiting exhibition and entertainment exhibition. Um, every time we're out in public, any time someone who's not a square dancer can see us, that's recruiting, or at least it's community awareness. And awareness is the first step of recruiting. So I, I use a lot of different music, though I am pretty well grounded in bluegrass. Yeah, well, while Connie's running the microphone, I'll just uh, speak up and say, we well, had com- comments up here. Um, we'll just speak up and say, in the, also in northern New Jersey, we had a chance to demonstrate or show our activity prior to the opening of Oklahoma at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. And they gave us a barbecue, and they were hoping to sell tickets. They The deal originally was... If a square dancer showed up and bought a ticket, they could get another ticket for for free. So it's buy one, get one for free. They were hoping to sell 50 tickets. 200 square dancers showed up, and they've had us back every year since. You know, that one was Oklahoma, which met the stereotype. The next show they had the next year was uh, Thoroughly Modern Millie, and they still had the square dancers invited to come and demonstrate. And we also have done a demonstration 
in uh, before a show at another local theater group. And so all of a sudden, it's, wow, the people who square dance also attend plays or musicals. They're, they're not just sitting there sucking on the hay bale. Uh, I guess I am on. Uh, Darlene Vusen, I'm from Mesa, Arizona. Um, I just want to give you a reference article. It was published December 16th, page one of the Wall Street Journal. It was, it was sent out by John Marshall to the, the Color Lab membership and it's called, If They uh, Want It to Be Hip, They Shouldn't Call It Square Dancing. Tana Rarick, um, York, Pennsylvania, via Chicago and Kansas City. So we've been kind of all over. Um, if you know the history of square dancing, when Mr. Henry Ford called you and invited you to a banquet, you showed up in formal attire, and that's where we started. Um, we went to the 50s. We were buying dresses off the rack to go to a dance. Nowadays, you you really almost can't do that anymore. I'm a caller's wife. I try very hard to remain within realms where I won't be detrimental to his business, but I also try to instill some change. Um, I have the skirts. I love the crinolines. They're a blast to dance in. They really are. But you've got women out there that only wear slacks. And we've had two top-of-the-line square dance students. One claims that she can't dance, so she remains a, a, an eternal student so that she doesn't have to wear crinolines. The other one has stopped dancing. Now, this is my concern. I want them on the floor dancing. So, again, as long as it's clean and reasonable, let them come. Is it because it's in your area or? Um, well, it, it, I'm sorry. Give me the microphone. I'm sorry. Um, in our experience, we have found that there is a difference between, like, a metropolitan area and a non, a not so metropolitan area. Um, metropolitan areas generally tend to um, want to diversify more. It's it's it if you're if you're from the country, it's easier to 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 fit in. Um, and and I think there is more resistance to changing perhaps in the country whereas in the in the metropolitan area everybody understands you just don't da- dress this way okay um, while we're running the microphone let me see if this will play over there yeah just wait for a second Karen come on play you little beast Square dance music. But it was actually brought out by TNT recently. It's off of Michael Jackson, too. People will recognize it. But it's not square dance music. And maybe we can or can't change the name of this activity. Yeah, maybe we can or can't change the name of this activity to, oh, I know what I've done, to, uh, something other than square dance but we can change perceptions even without changing the name <clears throat> comments over there karen her um from denver colorado i think you guys have touched on costumes really nicely in dress code because i think that's important you've touched on music but something you haven't touched on is lessons always start quote in september and go a long time you have to change 
yeah, I know you, se- several places are changing that aspect, but you also need to change when it starts because when they hear about it, this generation is now, not six months from now. Six months from now, they found something else to do. So you need to offer lessons more often stagger them, do something different so that lessons aren't starting in September every year. I think that's something to consider, too. And Ruth, I think. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Edison from uh, New Jersey, from New Jersey. We had, um, we have a, a person in one of the class, uh, clubs in uh, New Jersey, and uh, she does nothing but dance a boy's part, and she always wears slacks, a shirt, and a tie. She came to national convention a few years ago, and they wouldn't let her in. So, you know, Lori, Lori Mazziotti was there, and she went out, and she said, she told them, she said, this lady dances only boy's part, and she's dressed for a boy. She's wearing slacks, a white shirt, and a tie. And uh, they finally let her in, but... Uh, this, this is what I mean about we need tolerance. I, I saw that happen with someone else um, who also danced the boys' part and was dressed appropriately at a national convention. And I know I went that day and spoke to Jean and Connie about it at the reception they were having. So it's happened more than once, unfortunately. Now, um, to address Karen stuff, and I do have a handout. One of the things that's on my handout is we're talking to callers here, a lot of, a lot of callers, plus you VIPs and caller partners. We need to have dances that are open to the new people on a regular schedule. There is something that Tony Oxendine and some of the callers, uh, and Jerry Story actually, and some of the callers from Texas put together called the ABC program. If you look up Jerry Story's website, he has all the parameters on there. What it is is a, a, a set of calls, so that would be the core group of calls. It's kind of like a Chinese menu. You have the core group of calls, and then you have the A column, the B column, and the C column. So say you run a dance in January, and you teach the beginning calls, which is more than what I would teach in a, in a beginner party, but you teach those calls. So then the next time in February, you have another dance, regular regular basis, but not too much pressure to come out every week. And you teach the core group of calls, but you have a lot of overlap. So then you can teach calls from column A. In March, you have another dance. The core group of calls gets used. The A calls are gone by the wayside, and you teach calls from column B. So if people have come to the first two dances, they get a lot of familiar material, but each time there's something a little different. And then there's a a C column, which has another set of dances. It's just a way to do this. The problem that I see as a caller is that most callers – who work with, say, mainstream and plus groups, who have another job on the side, etc., have not had enough, and, and may not teach lessons very often, have not had enough experience moving dancers without the entire mainstream program. You give somebody a truncated list and they go, I can't call. Uh, I, got it. I, I, I had a friend of mine who was a newer caller, who shall remain nameless, several years ago, I had her sub for me at a club I was teaching at. And I deliberately had taught swing through. I deliberately had not yet taught boys run. Because I want to teach them separately. I want to space them out. She couldn't get out of ocean waves without boys run. You laugh, but it's not funny. If people can't move the dancers, if we callers can't move the dancers without all of the calls on the mainstream program, we can't do these dances for new people. We can't make them feel like they're dancing. They're going to be standing around while we teach them enough so that we can actually function as callers rather than having just four or five calls and they can function as dancers. And that's one of the things that I've said we need to do our homework as callers to learn how to do with that. Um, targeting, you know, let's have realistic targets. People in their, you know, we'd love to see the people in their 20s, love to see the people in their 30s. What are the people in their 20s doing? They've gotten out of college or and, and they've got a job. They have to pay off their student loan. They're getting into a relationship. They've been married. They have a baby. And all of this makes it very hard for them to commit to anything. So if we don't have something that they can go to periodically, they're not going to show up at all. Uh, same with the 30-year-olds. They are in their career. And these days, people have careers. They do not have jobs. What's the difference? A job I go to, I had a job. 
I worked for the welfare department. I was wanted, they wanted me in by nine o'clock at the latest, and I had to leave by uh, five forty-five, absolutely, or they were going to cl- throw me out of the building and close the building up because they didn't want to pay me any overtime. And so that's a job. A career is there's a project, Gene, and you have to get it done, and you stay until it's done. And not only men have jobs with and careers with jobs with projects, women have them too now. So that whole idea of coming home in time for lessons that was there in the 60s and the 70s isn't there anymore because society has changed. And that's part of what we have to address. So we need to figure out different ways of doing it. Yeah, I think we're past, just about past time. Um, i got like three or four minutes left. So I have a handout here that talks about all this stuff anyway. Uh, but So we need to pick realistic targets. If you're going to pick 30-year-olds, target them as families. Have a program that's going to encompass the whole family. We have a newer caller rec- uh, who in northern New Jersey who homeschools his kids. He started, and he has a big enough basement to do it, he started a, a square dance club called the Homeschool Hoedowners that, that includes all the families of, of friends of his who homeschool their kids. So that's another way to go. What we have to do is stop saying it was done this way. Society isn't doing it this way anymore. Oh, we, we go to 10.15? Oh, good. Cool. Talk some more. Uh, we got a couple hands up back there, but uh, I wanted to tell a quick story on myself. Um, Betsy was talking about the, uh, I think it was the lady that couldn't get out of the wave without saying boys run or something like yeah. that. Okay. When we were learning, um, we were going through our, and they were called classes back then, uh, The problem I had was take a peek, take a peek and trade the wave. And our caller never called trade the wave without saying take a peek. It was always that way. So we go to one of our first dances, halfway dances out, and the caller says trade the wave. I was lost because he didn't say take a peek. Now I can trade the wave fairly easy. But uh, it uh, it is if you learn it one way and it's called a different way, and that's why we encourage our dancers to go dance to other callers, is so you can learn the different ways that people call and everything. Go ahead. Don Yost in Erie, Pennsylvania. I'd like to expand on just a little bit on what uh, Betsy said about the ABC program. One thing she didn't mention about ABC is that it's not hash. Even though there's a limited number of calls, they're put together in poems or routines, and dancers learn that entire routine, and it's not changed. You don't change it from the first time through. You don't change it from the first dance to the next dance. When a dancer learns that routine... You can change the music and use it in a dozen different pieces of music, but that routine stays the same. So they have a lot less to learn. They don't have to learn every way to every combination of these calls, just the routines. And that makes it easier, and that's why it's easier to um, get the dancers to use 20 calls in, in, a, in a period of uh, three weeks. Hello, I'm Betsy Taylor from Silver Spring, Maryland. And in my own club, I recently discovered that two of the ladies who've been dancing with me, we dance casual all the time. They have, they do not own a skirt. I wanted them to come with me to learn to dance with other people. One of them had been dancing the boys part and we've been told that therefore they can wear pants to some of these events because they're dancing man, and they're able to wear pants, but the other one isn't. And it's very strange to me to think that someone doesn't own a skirt and has never owned a skirt. But if this is the case, we have to allow people like that into our activity. There's more than I realized. Uh, 
Janet Oliveri from Denver, Colorado, and I have comments on just about everything, but I'll try to keep it short. We dance every Tuesday night in a restaurant. Every Tuesday night is an exhibition dance. We don't care what our dancers wear. We want to attract everybody and every age. We have classes that are taught by two callers, so they always get two voices and two different styles of, of uh, learning. We have kids from nine years old to 85 years old. And we, right now, our classes happens to be about 35 college students. Um, as far as the, um, the dresses, like, oh, I already said that. Um, I, I'll stop there. <laughs> Betsy uh, brought up something about um, uh, targeted people. Um, I'm promoting contact your local YMCAs. <clears throat> These YMCAs are popping up everywhere, new ones. They're expanding. We have a new one in New Albany, Indiana. It's been in operation for one year. They have 6,000 members in one year. They're everywhere. They're looking for ways to to have Exercise, we fit perfectly into that category. The socialized aspect of our uh, activity fits perfect into there. So if you can go to your local Y and talk to them about getting uh, getting a dance night. Don't call it square dance or round dance, whatever. Call it a dance night. We had one in Corden, Indiana, after we started on this trip. They had 65 people wanting to learn how to square dance from that one dance night. And they're going to have another one. I think maybe have it already or it'll be coming up soon. So look, go to your local Y and see if you can get in with them and get something going. I'm going to preach some more. One of the things, you know, we talk about lessons and people want to learn to square dance. And I'm going to address, again, the callers. Callers, can you make your, your square dance, quote, lessons, unquote, actual dances? Can you move people with five or six calls and do a singing call with five or six calls? And some, I've done this, I've done this panel before and some people have heard this story but i have a friend who lives outside of philadelphia his sister learned to dance somewhere in virginia he did not tell me the name of the caller deliberately so i can't tell you and i wouldn't but that caller told them about two-thirds of the way through their series of lessons that they were now ready to do a singing call and again you laugh But how many people are out there teaching lessons that look like we all joined the military and we're walking around without any music and just practicing the moves? Well, we're drilling and we're drilling and we're drilling and we're drilling and it's not any fun. Fun is to move to the music. Fun is to socialize. And fun is to be able to give enough time so that people can actually relax and dance and make some eye contact rather than just walking around going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, I can't do this. And, you know, um, and whose job is that? That's those of us who are teaching the lessons and those of us who are teaching the people who are going to be teaching the lessons. All of those that factors are important, and we need to stress. Square dances have patter calls and singing calls most of the time. That's the way most of the lessons should be presented, in my opinion. I know there'll be people who differ with me. Now, when I go and do school programs, I have a limited amount of singing call music that I think could relate to the kids. So maybe in 45 minutes, I'll only do one singing call, but I'll save it for the end so it's like dessert, you know. And and, and hopefully they'll get a uh, they'll get the feeling that this was special. We were able to do this, but. Th- but the point being, I will always try and do patter and singing calls when teaching. I want people to feel like they are dancing. And I have a very good sensor on my tongue for not using calls that I haven't taught yet. So I'm usually pretty good. But that's what callers need to develop. The ex- newer callers, you know, they're going, well, it's always swing through, boys run. No, it's not. Not if you haven't taught boys run. And the phrase... If you strike the phrase from your 
vocabulary, if you are a caller who teaches lessons, strike the phrase from your vocabulary, I'm going to teach you wheel and deal so I can do this singing call. I've heard it used. We can laugh, but that's out there. So what impression are those newer dancers getting of square dancing? And then, of course, they can't really wheel and deal because they just learned it. So they have no time and no way to do it in the singing call because they can't react to it. And so they fail. And what happens when they fail? They go home. They feel bad. And they go home and they tell their friends, I tried square dancing. It was too hard. So the next time we're advertising, these people are already not hearing us, no matter what we say. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll just touch on a couple of things about advertising, if I may. Stress relief. Talk about talk to people. When we talk about square dancing, what do we talk about to the people? I've heard dancers who are dedicated dedicated to the activity and they talk about, well, you know, you learn mainstream and then you learn plus and there's these levels and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's not what we should be used talking about. First place, and I'm very strong on this, I am a square dancer. I am not a challenge dancer. I am not a mainstream dancer. I am a square dancer. Uh, there are people who have learned to dance who are, say, plus dancers, and they're too good to dance mainstream. Uh, uh, but that's sad. It's not, you know, it, it's kind of funny, but it's sad. We should be able to have fun dancing whatever, you know, if the caller is really good, it doesn't matter what program the list they're calling from. But So talk to the people about stress relief, physical and, and mental exercise, a wide group of friends. Talk to them about those benefits of square dancing. Advertising should not be one, once a year, but constant. Um, I went outside of Philadelphia to a craft show. I am a big fan of craft shows. I do some crafting myself, but I, you know, I dedicate certain money that I, that I earned calling. I dedicate that money. It goes in a little envelope to spend at craft shows. So I don't have any guilt later because I'm only spending cash. But, so I went out there. I came out of the craft show and I looked at the car next to me and in the window was a sign and it said, want to learn to square dance? Um, call this number and, or www.perkypromenaders.org. And I didn't get close enough to read the fine print and I said, boy, I gotta remember when I go call at Perky Promenaders to ask who else was at the craft show. And it turned out a friend of mine who's here was, was driving that car. But they, he keeps that, bumper sticker in his window all the time. He doesn't have it on his bumper. He has it in his window, but he keeps it there all the time, all year round. Uh, bookmarks in your local library with a square dance information number. You know, hey, square dancers actually know how to read and use the library. <laughs> and there is a new website that my husband's working on that was sponsored by the Arts Dance Pro- uh, 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 group. Arts is, stands for Alliance of Traditional Round and Square Dancers. It has most of the major groups that are in our activity as part of it. And um, they are funding this website, which is designed for newer dancers. The URL will be you, the number two, can dance... Um, Dot com. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And it's if you go there now, it's just under development. But we're hoping to have it up and running very, very soon. They will have videos of all of the activities. There will be a round dance video, a square dance video, a contra dance video. And the clips will show people enjoying themselves, people of various ages, and, and hopefully people wearing varied clothing. They will be wearing clothing. Naked wouldn't be bad. Um, uh, just closing comments um, we do have a dress code at the National Square Dance Convention I have a copy of these up here if y'all would like to take one with you Um, we discuss dress codes every meeting we have it comes up Um, Ron and Nancy uh, Ron and Cindy were in our uh, meeting this year for the first time and they know we do discuss it um I'm not saying any changes will be made, but if you have comments regarding the dress code, our website is nsdcnec.com, and we'd love to hear from you. 
I will take some of the comments that I heard today back to our meeting in Louisville and uh, see what happens. Uh, but one group, uh, you know, we talk about the 20s and the 30, 20-year-olds and the 30-year-olds. We need to concentrate on the 45-year-olds because they're the ones that are the empty nesters. The kids are growing up. they are going off to college or they're married or whatever, and mom and dad don't have anything to do, so they're looking for a place to go. That's what... That's true. When I was growing up, 20 and 30 was real old. As I got a little older, 30 and 40 was old. And the older you get, the younger it is. Two minutes. Any other questions or comments? Nope. One. Dan Prosser, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Again, just elaborating on a couple of things. One, for the last ten years, we have not used the term class or lessons. Uh, dancers, when they come out the first night, are ne- it's an it's an introduction to square dancing. Has absolutely nothing to do with you're going to go through twenty weeks of class. You're going to go a plus next summer. You're going to be able to dance at club. The people that help say nothing about this. We want them there one of two nights to try it. There's an introduction of two square dancing. The middle of that we tell the middle of that evening we tell them the next ten weeks will be an introduction to square dancing. Nothing again. Just an introduction to square dancing. If you'd like to find out about it, no, there's no dress because that's not an issue. The middle of that time, the people will say, "What happens after ten weeks?" And say, "Well, there are more square dance calls, and if there's enough folks that are interested, we're going to continue with those." But in the beginning of February, we're going to start another ten-week program, and we're going to piggyback you guys right on top of them. Okay, for the first three weeks, there's no charge, and after that, everybody will dance. I have an accelerated 12-week program that I teach, and that allows me to get through all that material. I do not teach a traditional way. When I do a one-night program, as all of you do, you teach 12 or 15 calls. Okay, well, I do anyhow, and it, with great success, and I've done it since the man that taught me that called for 50 years. But but every, anybody, how it doesn't matter. But if the people came back the following week, all right, they would be able to do most of those calls with very little review. So I don't feel that I have to drill people two or three calls a week. I can give them lots of calls and a tip, forget about it, go to the next tip and do the other calls, forget about it, because next week I'm going to give them a different mix, and over a four-week period of time they will, just because they've experienced the dancing, they've learned the calls, and if they miss a week, they haven't missed the major teach because of the review. So dress is not an issue, and when people see people dress, we have ladies, and, and some ladies don't like the dress, so they'll wear what they want. But other ones will say, you know, that looks neat. All right, lady told me, she said, women... T or women and, and girls dress Barbie and Ken when they were little. They love to dress their husbands. Okay, they're not going to let their husband go out of the house not looking well. Children, I work with homeschool children. I can't I, all the far, all the square dance clothes that I can find that fit them. They'll wear. They wear them to school. They wear crinolines. They love it. You know, and many t- many of the dancers that come through our program are not forced to wear anything special, but they will gravitate toward that because they look, they like the color and they like the dress. The people that don't, we don't make an issue of it. No one's ever turned away. But we really, I've never seen anybody come in flip-flops and shorts, and I think they understand that if I was going to a ballroom dance at Hershey Hotel, I wouldn't go in there in flip-flops and shorts. It's a ballroom dance, and there's a certain etiquette that you follow. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Joe Duncan, King George, Virginia. I've only been calling 38 years, only half the time that Betty has. So uh, I don't know about the long, 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 long Henry Ford skirts. I do know that I've heard a lot of information here today, and I can honestly say I agree with hardly any of it. Square dancing is an activity that is unique. And it should be unique. Now, I've, I've heard a lot of people 
today that are embarrassed by their activity. I've heard a lot of people that are resistant to change. Well, that's great. But when you talk about changing the image of your activity, don't completely change it into something else that doesn't resemble what we like. Dancing is fun. So when you think about changing your image, look at what's fun in our activity. Emphasize changing the activity so we can uh, display more of the fun or whatever you think is good in the activity. Don't harp too much on the things that you really don't like. But keep in mind that this is dancing. You can't turn out dancers in two two week sessions. I mean, you can't put somebody through a plus zero to plus, most people, in twelve weeks. It only hurts the activity when you rush people through. You continue to make our activity go downhill instead of uphill when we think more about the numbers of people than the quality of people that we're bringing into the activity. I have never been to a Civil War enactment where people came out dressed as baseball players. I've never been to a hockey game where they wore swimsuits. This is square dancing. It has a, uh, a, a uniform. It has something that is associated with it. So if you want to change the image, think about the things that we can change that won't hurt the activity, but will enhance the activity. Now, I'm off my soapbox. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we're out of time. Oh, Bo says he's going to be quick. I'm really going to dovetail on what Joe said. I'm Bo Byerly. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. It's not the activity. It's what everybody else's perception of our activity is. Joe's right. We have a lot of fun. We've got, we've got something that's great. But what we need to do is we need to convince everybody else that what we've got is great. So whenever you meet a non-square dancer, emphasize the fact that we have a load of fun. Don't tell them how complicated it can be. Don't tell them anything about lessons and classes and dresses and crinolines and stuff. That's not the important part. We're here because we have a great time. And it's a good activity. So we need to work on everybody else's perception of what we do. Okay. Thank you, Bo. And that is the end of our time, or more than the end of our time. Thank you, Gene and Connie, for your participation. Thank all of you for attending. And don't forget to take a handout.